So we did our multiple application um, experiment, and which is in review right now, and I'm very excited about mm-hmm. that, um, and with Lewis's help on that as well. And then um, we are doing another study, which is actually going to be chapter two for my dissertation. That the multiple application ones, chapter one. Mm-hmm. So oh, scary. Um, mm-hmm. But we're doing multiple applications, and this is basically the study right here. So we have six treatments, and we have three treatments in in a group of um, in a group that will have a brood break, and then we have three treatments that are going to be in a non brood break group. Mm-hmm. In the brood break group, what we did and how we uh, accomplished this is we took the queen, mm-hmm. we moved her above a queen excluder and gave her one frame to lay eggs on. And everything else, either she was honey bound or they were just undrawn frames. Mm -hmm. We did not cage her. I didn't want to put her in a physical cage and hold her for 14 days. I wanted her to continue with her QMP production because she's laying eggs so that the colony is happy and they're not gonna supersede her. Mm -hmm. So as, and then too, as a newer beekeeper, you don't necessarily want to pick up a queen and put her in a cage. Well, and so, you know what question's coming up? What about the brood on that frame? Okay, well let me. Let, yeah. Okay. But <laughs> so I have to learn to be quiet. No, 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 no. <laughs> Please ask no. Because thank you, because you'll remind me to say yeah. it. Um, so we moved the queen above the excluder for 14 days, and then on day 14 we removed the excluder. We took that frame that she had laid on, and we gave it to other colonies that were not in the study. And I'll explain what we can do with those later if, if this was actually going to be in my apiary. Mm-hmm. Then on day 21, we came in and treated. So our three treatment groups for was a zero gram, or our controls, mm-hmm. a two gram, and a four gram. Per, I, I'm sorry, a three gram. A per, zero. per box or per colony? Per box. Per okay. yeah. Now, we have shown not only our lab, but Cameron Jack, various other... Uh, labs across the country has shown that a one gram per brood box or per, per box, not just brood box but per box, is ineffective. It is not working. So we decided to go with two grams and then Cameron Jack had done a four gram in Florida where he was showing some, some good results um, with brood present mm-hmm. but four grams to me just seemed a bit excessive since most of our colonies were either two or three deep. So we would be looking at eight grams per colony or po- possibly even 12 grams mm-hmm. per colony. And and I just don't think we would ever see approval with a four gram application rate. So we decided to do the two, which I think we will get approval on, a two gram per brood box. Mm-hmm. And we decided, well, let's just try a three and we'll see. We'll move up to a three as yeah, well. Yeah. yeah. And we had a lot of debate, and I called you yeah, a lot and asking you, and, and Lewis and I were talking. I was talking. I, I consulted Cameron Jack down in Florida, got his opinion. And so after much, much gnashing of teeth, we decided to do a zero, two, and a three. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what's the mechanism? What's going on with the extra dosage? Is there a residual? What's going on there? What, why we is don't that know. Working? I mean, as far as well, I think I think the extra dose it just it needs to be a stronger approach, you know, with the two gram as opposed to a one gram. Now, yeah, but if you're having control with brood present, is it is it persisting in the colony for a little while? Is that what's going on? We don't know, and okay. and that's that's a great question. Now, as far as what Cameron came came up or his study that he published. I believe there were 10 colonies that he was using. Um, you would know better than I. Yeah, I think it was 10 colonies. So it wasn't a huge, you know, amount of number, amount of colonies that were um, a part of that study. And that's why we wanted to, to kind of get as many colonies as we could. And unfortunately, we were trying to get 15 colonies per, a, per, per group, treatment. but we ended up only doing 12. So I don't know. I don't know if there's a lingering effect of the oxalic acid. Uh, inside the colonies. That's what has been proposed through advertisement of this product. I don't know of any research that has shown that. 
that they've gone in and scraped and I wanted to do that. Like, should we scrape top bars? Should we scrape the inside of the colony and see if yeah. we're seeing mm -hmm. these residual crystals or not? Is there any research that's been done that shows us what an overdose looks like? No. In terms of damaging the bees? Yeah. It, okay, okay, well, yes. plus contaminating the honey possibly too. Mm. Okay, well that's two separate things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll let you but do yeah, that. first damaging the bees. At what point are we doing harm? We okay with the oxalic acid application. Like, let's look at the study we did last year. Seven applications. We had absolutely no detrimental effect to bees, brood, queen, etc. Um, we also collected honey samples, which we sent up to USDA, and Dr. Jay Evans analyzed that and did not see an increase in oxalic acid. Um, and he also has gotten samples from other researchers mm -hmm. across the U.S. and analyzed when they were oxoliking mm -hmm. and did not see an increase. So that has given us the approval to use oxalic acid while human consumable honey is on the colonies. Mm -hmm. And remind me again of what the dosage was? One gram. One gram. Per box. Okay. So now with the two grams per box, that's another investigation that will be looked at, yeah. of course. Um, for the label change, if there will be a label mm -hmm. change. But anyway, so we we did the study, um, and you had asked about if though that was my frame, my my cat. Okay, but I'm back up. <laughs> so basically, on day 21, when we oxalic, there was no cat brood. Mm -hmm. Now there might have been a little bit of cat brood dronage, but this is midsummer. Our drone reproduction is way down. This might have been a little bit different if it was early spring, when there's a lot more drone, mm -hmm. you know, because then maybe you might want to do a day 24 as opposed to a day 21, but that's another study to do. But this one, we concentrated on day 21. All worker brood will have been emerged, and alongside them being emerged are the mites. Now, we are doing this during the day, not at night, so we are going to have a forage force that's going to be out. Yet, however, yet, but, um, because we don't have a nectar flow going on at this time, most of our forage force is going to be home. Mm -hmm. Not all of it. So yeah. we're, what do we think we're capturing? 90% of the mites in the colony? Almost certainly. Yeah. I would think. So. Okay. So that's, that's. Well, when are we going to see that? Well, we are, we have just finished yesterday. And all these, mm -hmm. as a matter of fact, there's all these sticky screens and there's, Hundreds over there, and we've just almost finished all yeah. our alcohol washes. Yeah, yeah. The camera doesn't show the true scene in this lab. <laughs> it is a wreck. Lab, yeah. We have been nonstop. Well, there were seventy-two colonies each sampled. Eighty-one. Uh, Eighty-one colonies. Sorry, yes, yeah, so and more than twelve per group. Um, yeah, some got like yeah about eight team. over eighty colonies each sampled minimum three times. So you know we're already talking about. 240 sticky screens. No, double that for sticky screens. About 500 sticky screens, 250 alcohol washers. So we well, that's where all the students come the in. No, so we did four alcohol washes. So <laughs> no, it's been, and we are almost done with the alcohol washes. Mm -hmm. We had we had some residual money from a grant, which it perfect timing that mm -hmm. we have to spend down by September, and we have. It's amazing. When you kind of put it out there, um, I need help. Three top-notch students came and said, "Hey, can I work yeah. at the B Lab?" And these these folks are amazing. Exceptional graduate entomologists. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're just they 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 um, one is still an undergrad and uh, two are going into grad school, mm -hmm. and then Ian is just graduated and he he's he's formulating his future right now. Mm -hmm. What was he going to do? But they. They have stuck it out in the heat and the humidity and the stings and the cankles. Um, wow. Chiggers. And chiggers and ticks and, yeah. But we just wrapped it up. We took mm -hmm. our last sticky screen out um, of all the colonies yesterday. And I've just been kind of looking and doing percent of mites. And it looks like we're getting some trends mm -hmm. where the colonies that had the brew break with the two gram or three gram we did see a reduction in mite numbers. Now, until... And we'd expect a fast reduction in mite numbers in those. Right. And this is really a kind of two-finding study where we're testing simultaneously both whether the higher dose can compensate for having brood if we do multiple applications, but if when there's no brood present, a single application is adequate. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's multiple parts 
sort of management advice that can come out of this this one a lot of stuff actually. study like, yeah into the... and we have we have this really amazing statistical analyst what's his name what's his name <laughs> i don't know but i've heard he's a right weirdo uh i know he's brilliant at at taking data and just making it so clean so i'm really excited to get this entered so uh, we and because he is looking for a job we have oh. a lot of pressure to get this published this year or get it at least mm -hmm. in review if not published but the multiple application paper should be published this year in Journal of Insect Science. I'm honestly surprised it's not out already. So yeah, Journal of Insect Science um, has um, Simone Fidstrom and Margarita Lopez Uribe organized a, a honeybee health special issue. So there's going to be an entire journal oh. issue oh. dedicated to applied honeybee health control and that uh, should by my understanding, go in there once we've got our peers' feedback. I've been reviewing other papers for that same issue, so there should be a wealth of information that drops later this year, including uh, some of this. But I will have to say that it almost didn't go into review or go into the, insect, <laughs> the Journal of Insect Science. Uh, I had kind of a... Writing, writing up a paper is hard. I mean, actually doing a study is hard. Can we talk about that for just a sure. second? <laughs> so, you know... I, I love I love the fact that we have YouTube and that there is information in, and we can at our fingertips instantly find mm -hmm. find something. Um, and I, I really applaud your YouTube videos, Bob, because you're you're not out there trying to sell something. You're out there trying to educate, which is so important mm -hmm. and it's so different from what a lot of people are doing on YouTube. Mm -hmm. They're out there trying to sell themselves or their product. Um, or to be famous, and they're putting bad information out there. And as research scientists and as extension um, specialists, it's very difficult. We're fighting that every day. Mm. And just like the multiple applications using oxalic acid multiple times, three times, four days apart, five days apart, six days apart, we're losing bees. No. And beekeepers are losing bees, and we're losing beekeepers because they're getting frustrated because they're not able to keep their colonies alive. Mm -hmm. And so that's why when I go and talk to, to beekeepers or to any group, frankly, and talk about research is so important, the science is so important, because we're not just looking at one colony or comparing two colonies. Mm -hmm. We're comparing hundreds of colonies. Um, over, you know, over and over. And we're analyzing it, not the way we want to analyze it, but the way science has us analyze mm -hmm. it. You know, so we can't make up our own rules. Mm -hmm. And then we have other science, you know, researchers that are reading our material and that approve it. But the most important part about what research is, is when you do a study if it can be replicated and gain the same results. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, not only do we do multiple colonies per treatment. And multiple apiaries. And multiple well. apiaries, so that we're um, adjusting for, uh, for anything that possibly could go wrong. But it's just so, it's just, anyway, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm getting off, but. No, good. Um, it's just <clears throat> so important that beekeepers realize or beekeepers get information from reputable sources and not from some Joe guy on the internet that's trying to tell them to mix this and that and the other and it's worked in his colonies or her colonies mm -hmm. um, because that's and it may have worked it may have, but yeah. there been but maybe there was no mites to begin with right. or maybe the colony had swarmed and there was a long brood break when they apply the material, whatever that they're mm -hmm. doing. So there's so many different things, and that's what we do when we start a study. How many bees are in this colony? How much brood? How many mites? You know, is there a queen? Is it healthy? Is there anything else going on? And and so we know the be how how this colony starts, and then how this colony ends. And that's so important to have that information. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Mm -hmm. And those colonies get blindly assigned to treatment groups. Mm -hmm. It's very tempting, I think, for amateur researchers to look and say, oh, well, if we're testing this, this um, new mic technique, let's make sure that we 
put colonies with lots of mites in that group. And that is a horrendous statistical fallacy that we call regression to the mean that will give you false information. And it's very tempting to say, oh, well, I'll put my colonies that have all the mites in the treatment group, but that will guarantee you that you get what looks like control, even if it doesn't work. Um, and I don't have time to give a lecture on why that is, but it's one of those things that's drilled into us very early when we're doing parasite research, is that you know, things need to be blindly assigned to these treatment groups. You can't, you can't pick and choose which colonies go where, because even if you're well-intentioned about it, without understanding some of the nuances of, of how analysis works and how sampling can... You know, we never get a true measure of how many mites are in any colony. We are doing our best to estimate, but an alcohol wash is not perfect. It might be that the 100 bees you rolled happened to have more mites on them than is typical for that colony. Or they might have far less, less mites, right. you know. Yeah. I think the interesting thing that you just said, though, is that uh, if, you have a, if you have a colony that has a very high mite load, and or you that treat that. estimated to have a high mite load, because that's the thing. Mm -hmm. A right. subset of colonies, when you go out and do alcohol washes that look like they have my, high mite loads, yeah. might have mite loads exactly the same as all your other colonies. It right. is just that those hundred bees you rolled happened to be the bees with mites. And so if you went back and measured that colony again, chances are you're yeah. going to get a lower number. And that's where that problem comes in. Where if on that first wash, you say, oh, well, here's my high ones, put them in the treatment group. Right. It might have just been by random chance that they had higher numbers. Mm -hmm. Right. And so then when you go back and measure the second time, you are more likely with those colonies to get a lower number, right. even if nothing changed. And that's where you can put yourself in this experimental trap where you've set yourself up to get a result. And then you conclude but, that this works. <clears throat> yes. And that's a big, big problem we see with a lot of a lot of young scientists, even when they enter grad school, might be tempted to do that kind of thing. And until they've gone through the motions and, and kind of been forced to stand at a chalkboard, which we have at the back there, mm -hmm. and, and work through that, yeah. um, it, it's difficult to intuit. And, you know, and it takes time. And that's why, that's why we do what we do, you know? And it, yeah, and I'll go back to so many of the studies that we've done here, you know, the powder sugar uh, small cell, you know, we want, I w personally wanted those to work because yeah. how nice is it to sprinkle some yeah. powdered sugar into a colony and your mites are gone. Yeah. And, you know, so I have, as a, as a researcher, we have to take that bias out. And like you said, blind, like when we're doing alcohol washes, we know the number as we're doing the wash, but we have no idea what, what treatment Which it is. Which colony that's. What, yeah. We know the colony number, but yeah. we don't know what treatment groups it, it's in. So we can't even... You know, going through the entirety, we we never have. We can't put our human emotion into it, and mm. like, well, maybe I'll I'll kind of slide this slide one this. <laughs> under the Ooh, this had zero mites. Ooh, you know, it should be this. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, right, right. It, the uh, three three gram uh, brood break mm. should work. Sorry, yeah. I'm pounding. Um, should work, but well, tell me, okay, what kind of. Uh, treadmill are you going to put my bees through? <laughs> what, what are you doing there? So that's our fourth study. <laughs> Which yeah, we'll be beginning in about a week from now? Two weeks from now? August, uh, a something? week from Monday. A week from yeah. Monday. Yeah, so it's Friday okay, Hopefully today. we got a few mites for you now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, was well, a shocker. By we the were way. actually going to start. So, uh, so No mites. Speaking of, I need to potentially put a request in with you about getting some mites. Um, yes, but we'll yeah. speak about you this study first. Get, get some mites? We'll need, yeah, we'll talk about it in a little bit. <laughs> don't need to be on this. Okay. So, going back to the extended release shop towels, the, the gentleman down in Argentina developed this material, and the trade name is called Allian Cap. And it's... Say that again. Allian. I actually... Allian? Let me, and you know what, I can go get, let me go get the box. Mm -hmm. okay, yeah, y'all chat and I'll be right back. I'll go get the box. And yeah, so this is a fully licensed product in Argentina. It's been through their equivalent of EPA and USDA regulations. Um, it's, it's developed by a company and it looks very similar to the, the um, Amitraz, the Apivar strips that one would oh. put in a colony. Right. Except instead of it being Amitraz that's the active ingredient, it's oxalic and it's embedded in a in a cellulose matrix, and cellulose is just um, fiber. It's just plant plant fiber, mm -hmm. um, like dietary fiber, almost. So the idea being that it's held stable, and then you get this slow release of oxalic acid, or um, 
oxalate, which is the same thing. And it's pre-made up, you have exact dosing, you're not having to have beekeepers mix up things over their stove top or anything a little bit dangerous like that. Um, and because it's been licensed in another country, it's much easier for us then to import it to test. Why? Wow. Yeah. There we go. Can I just say the EPA really got their panties in a wad when they saw the video and pictures of people mixing oxalic acid and sugar syrup on their stove? Yeah, uh, it's yeah, not. Yeah. What there does was, that mean? <laughs> there was no chance on God's green earth they were going to allow that to be made legal. EPA, I mean, you I know. Me to, do you want me to edit out the panties in a wad part? No, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, okay. but, but it was a. You know, EPA puts a label on products, or they don't necessarily put that label, but they, through the process, that label is there to protect you. Mm -hmm. the beekeeper, and to protect the environment, mm -hmm. and to protect the bees. And In that order. And that's yeah. why they are unlikely to approve something like an 8 gram oxalic if 4 gram is adequate for vaporization because it's not pleasant for beekeepers and it's dangerous. Yeah, really I, dangerous. I personally know beekeepers who have forgot to put on their goggles, forgot to put on their respirator, and one of them, I won't name who he is, but he's a good colleague of mine, he's also a professor of biology, takes chemistry very seriously and just happened to forget one day had a blowback of oxalic acid vapor and he was in the hospital for days mm. with retinal burning and so you know EPA labeling is there to prevent those kind of tragedies I'll see 10,000 dead bees before I see a dead beekeeper in yeah. my time you know and that that is part of right. part of what this is about and that's why the label is so important well these strips look fairly substantial yeah. so here it is and this is what we'll be testing in a couple of weeks in bob's colonies mm -hmm. and we're also collaborating did you say with auburn university no yeah that's true um, so, so it's spelled spell it a l u e n cap and yeah. i don't know what that stands for um, but the gentleman that we're working with down in Argentina has been absolutely delightful. Mm -hmm. um, and we're also collaboratively working with Dr. Jeff Williams at Auburn University and Dr. Stephen Cook at USDA and Dr. Jay um, Evans at USDA. So they're, they're claiming 95% effective right, right there. Right, right. And they are strips. Mm -hmm. Um, and they will just, you know, you'll put them into the, into the colony for an extended release of the oxalic acid. I am very excited about testing this product and Same. being a part of, of the, the crew. Oh, it's heavy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm very excited because if this works, boy, what a godsend. Mm -hmm. I mean, seriously, um, to have something that's already already a product that's... that Already we'll have, in production. It's basically. already in production. Now, it will have to be approved. It, they will have to apply for the license and all of that. Um, that our data will contribute to that, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. In Argentina, is it uh, expensive? Is it an expensive product? You know, I don't know because we didn't have to pay for this. I have no idea what the okay. cost is. But mm -hmm. to me, what is Apivar per strip, or per colony? Well, if you just have 10 colonies, it's running you up about around 360 a strip. Okay. Yeah. Now, now add, add that up for that colony. How much money do you have in that colony? Oh yeah. Well, I mean, how much woodenware? How much your frames? Yeah. How much time your bees? You know. So to me, even paying ten dollars per colony. Now I'm not on a commercial scale, but for a backyard beekeeper, um, or even a, a, a small commercial beekeeper, I've got to look at kind of the cost as far as you know what I have in. Now you know more about this than I do, because of labor and your honey production and nuke sales and all of that that you have to have a certain profit margin yeah. from that colony well, so who is, knows yeah who knows I, I get it it's you know whatever the cost it's worth it my ape of our bill last year was eighteen thousand dollars that's kind of hard to swallow mm -hmm. you know? yeah, yeah but your colony survived but my colony survived well Ape, okay. That's another step. I don't know if I should go there right now. <laughs> Apivar did not work well for us. We had to come back. Well, that's precisely what I'm going to ask you about. So a lot of the work we're moving towards now with a grant that I just went in with with a large team of researchers um, coming from this evolution of resistance background is looking at resistance to amitraz in Varroa. And that's something that I'm very interested in. It's something we're interested in looking into with the oxalic acid to see what the resistance potential is in the mites of that. All 
evidence so far points towards them being very incapable of adapting to cope with oxalic. Well, but we know they can adapt to amitraz. Well, it, this leads to an, an impossible question, mm -hmm. probably with an impossible answer. How does oxalic acid work on we the mice? We simply do not know. It is still something that no scientist has adequately demonstrated, which is unusual and it is humbling to say that, but it, the, the physiology and biochemistry that underpins oxalic acid's mode of action is still scientifically unknown.